Paris, noted Casanova. Despite all the wit of the French is and will always be a city in which impostors will succeed. He had landed squarely on his feet. The Palais Royal Gardens, with their cafes, tarts and gossip, became his outdoor salon. His actor friends, the Balletti, invited Casanova to stay with them in the house they were renting for the hunting season near Versailles, which afforded him his closest view yet of the royal centre of French life and of Louis XV's mistress, Madame de Pompadour. One evening, Casanova found himself at a theatrical entertainment seated directly under but in view of La Pompadour's box. She asked who he was and was told that the young man was Venetian. La Pompidou leaned over her box and asked him if it was true that he was from down there. From where? From Venice, she reiterated. Venice, madam, is not down, replied Casanova bravely and curtly to the de facto Queen of France. It is up. The Duc de Richelieu, La Pompidou's companion, asked which of the two actresses Casanova preferred. He indicated his choice. She has ugly legs, opined Richelieu. One does not see them, replied the cocky young Venetian, and in any case, in assessing a woman's beauty, the first thing I always put aside are her legs. Later he claimed his use of the French écarté to put aside or spread was inadvertent, but in the competitively witty bear pit of court theatres it was the sort of thing to get a young man noticed. And it did. Casanova returned to his ladabout town existence, supported by his winnings from cards and the generosity of friends. He was learning French and gaining a reputation at court, but neither brought him money or definite prospects. He gradually became aware that he had failed in Paris to capitalize on a brilliant opening scene or two and decided to return to Venice. Ascension Day when Casanova arrived home in 1753, was the greatest day in the Venetian calendar. For the ceremonial marriage of Venice with the sea, the doge threw a golden ring into the waves. Casanova, in turn, threw himself straight back into Venetian life. I returned, well informed, full of myself, giddy, loving pleasure, vigorous and mocking. I partied night and day. Through the carnival season of 1753, Casanova, a soigné 28-year-old, took Catarina Capretta, a prodigy of unspoiled nature, on her first tour of Venice. He bought a box at the San Samuele Theatre, took her to the gardens of Giudica. Unexpectedly, but deliciously, the libertine found himself in love. The more innocent I found her to be, he wrote of Catarina, the less I could make up my mind to possess her, my soul was struggling. Caterina ended the struggle. In the Judica Gardens she told him she was willing to be his wife before God. Casanova could no longer resist the compelling force of nature and made love to her, calling her his little wife. By early summer Caterina was pregnant and Casanova persuaded his wealthy benefactor to plead his case as a suitable husband. Her father, not knowing of the pregnancy, sent her instead to the convent of Santa Maria degli Angeli on Murano, a repository for wayward girls. At the end of July she miscarried. Casanova was aghast. He would have himself rowed out to Santa Maria on Murano for mass at the convent church. Here he could be seen by Caterina from behind the grill, though he could not talk to her. He sent her a miniature of himself, hidden behind one of St. Catherine mounted on a ring. On All Saints' Day, things at the convent took an unexpected turn. Casanova was passed a note as he left to return to Venice. It was a direct invitation to an intrigue, and a full-blown affair with an older nun, M.M., M., followed, which ended the likelihood of his marriage to Caterina. An assignation was arranged at a private casino. M.M. M. served him a meal with pink champagne. He reasoned that an affair with a libertine nun would be an infidelity of a kind to Caterina, but it could not offend her because it would only be meant to keep me alive and so preserve me for her. 
M.M. was a patrician's daughter, rich in her own right, and kept in some style by her protector, the French ambassador, Cardinal de Berny. She was a perfect beauty, tall, so white of complexion, with an air of nobility. Casanova rented an expensive casino in which to entertain M.M. She arrived dressed as a man which thrilled Casanova. After the carefully prepared supper, ices, oysters, punches and burgundy wine, they made love. For men, Casanova wrote, sex is like eating and eating is like sex. It is nourishment. And just as there is always a different pleasure in trying different sources, so it is in the game of love. Later, M.M. presented Casanova with a new twist in their lubricious affair. Her protector, de Berny, was happy for their affair to continue, if he could watch their lovemaking through a peephole in the Murano Casino. Caterina guessed at Casanova's infidelity and was drawn into the circle. A menage à quatre developed, which Casanova did nothing to prevent. M. M. wrote suavely to him later that Caterina's mind was now as unprejudiced as ours. I have completed her education for you. Casanova later admitted to a certain remorse, though adding that I have never been able to decide whether I was truly ashamed or merely embarrassed. Caterina seems to have married a Venetian lawyer a little while after this, exactly as her father might have wanted, and yet was still in correspondence with Casanova years later, like so many of his past loves. Meanwhile, de Berny had concerns about Casanova's continuing affair with M.M. and its potential for scandal, not for its flouting of church rules, but those of class. Casanova's circle at the time also included Andrea Memo, the son of one of Venice's oldest families. Andrea and his brothers were Venetian blades, exactly as Casanova had dreamt of becoming, and they took up the actor's son as a drinking companion around the Campo San Stefano coffee houses and Malvesi, the wine shops that sold the fashionable sweet Malmsey. They attended the Ridotto, or masquerades, perhaps in the company of Casanova's enigmatic masked companion, M.M., but it was Casanova's socially aspirant choice of drinking companions, rather than his unorthodox sex life, that put him directly in the sight lines of the Doge's spies. Venice, though a city of pleasure, had also become a police state. It turned out that the Venetian Inquisition, who oversaw internal security in Venice, kept a close eye on those associating with the young members of the Venetian establishment, and viewed Casanova as a dangerous young radical, who manages to live at the expense of this or that person on the strength of his lies or his ability to cheat. On the 26th of July, 1755, nearly 40 men arrived at Casanova's rooms. They arrested him. Dozens of his books were confiscated. They ordered him to dress. Casanova put on his best ruffled shirt, a fine floss silk cloak and a dandy hat, trimmed with Spanish lace and a large feather. Casanova was taken into the Prigioni Nuove, a new prison by the Bridge of Sighs, designed to intimidate with its impenetrable architecture and mysterious reputation. As a suspect of the Inquisition, he was heading to the much-feared wells, the inquisitorial offices high in the Ducal Palace, and their special prison, I Piombi, the Leds, so named because they were directly under the palace's lead roof. Freezing in winter, the cells were ovens in summer. Casanova was escorted up ever narrower staircases and along smaller corridors to the cavernous space above the great council room. Here the jailer, Lorenzo, took Casanova the few yards to a larch wood lined cell, about eight feet by ten but only five feet high, bewildered, and in a state of shock, he heard the door slam behind him. During all of this, Casanova, as was the custom with Inquisition suspects, was told neither the charges against him nor the sentence that the Council of Three had passed. A five years' imprisonment. His crime was recorded as a question of religion. He had no trial. 
a man shut up by himself, alone in near darkness, where he cannot stand upright, longs for hell, if he believes in it just to have some company, he wrote. Little by little, his febrile mind turned to thoughts of escape. It had never been done. After a full nine months' imprisonment, a pallid Casanova was finally allowed out of his cramped cell for exercise. He took this in the half-dark of the undercroft beneath the medieval corner of the palace. The roof here is supported by a small forest of Byzantine brick pillars, and behind one Casanova found an iron spike. This he secreted back to his cell. With patience born of long solitary confinement, he worked away at the floorboards of his cell with the spike. He hid the growing hole, the detritus of large splinters, and ground up terrazzo under his bed. Then, on the 25th of August, 1756, without warning, Lorenzo informed him that he would be transferred to another cell. He had time only to hide the iron spike in the chair, which was transferred with him to his new cell next to the guard's room. On the other side of the corridor, there was a renegade priest, Marino Balbi. Casanova and he managed to communicate by scribbling notes in the books they exchanged, and each soon confessed his interest in escape. Casanova noted that Balbi was allowed a large collection of religious drawings, with which he had papered his cell and its ceiling, and reasoned that Balbi might hack through his ceiling into the shared void space above, concealing his progress with a picture. He smuggled the iron spike to Balbi, hidden in a Bible under a plate of butter-soaked gnocchi, and over the next few weeks Balbi got through his ceiling. From here, with little difficulty, he squeezed himself into the tight space between the larchwood cell ceilings and the lead roof of the palace. On the night before All Saints' Day, when nearly all of the inquisitors were away from the palace, he broke through into Casanova's cell, and together they struggled out onto the roof where they found a skylight that let them back into the palace. I found myself in a chamber that I recognized from the arrest. Casanova and Balbi were locked in the Inquisition offices. However, they still had the clothes they had been arrested in to change into, and had cut each other's hair as best they could, which was why, when a night watchman spotted them at the window of the square atrium, he assumed they were courtiers who had been locked in overnight. He let them out, and Casanova, with Father Balbi, walked calmly between the giant marble buttocks of Neptune and Mars, through which the doges pass after their coronation, and down the giant staircase to the Piazza San Marco. Casanova hailed a gondola. As the oars turned in their forcalas down the Judica Canal, he was suddenly racked with sobs. He would not see his homeland again for nearly 18 years. <laughs>